thank you Thank you Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz pianist, organist, vocalist, composer, actress, and educator Amina Claudine Myers. We caught up with her in May 2020 as the COVID-19 world was ramping up to talk about quite a bit. Over her illustrious career, she has performed nationally and internationally throughout Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia, and North America. She is well known for her work around the world of jazz, and her career began in her pre-teens and throughout high school, directing church choirs, singing and playing gospel and rhythm and blues. She talks about so much enjoy. Thanks for taking a minute out, and what I want to know from you as a creative artist, what have you been doing during this COVID-19 quarantine to stay creative and to kind of keep things moving? Well, I've been working um, on the organ working on some com- compositions I had written a while ago that were never developed. And I've been, you know, uh, playing those, working on improvising, and also working on a few of the organ, uh, 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 European classical pieces, some of box um, pieces, and Charles Ives, and... Uh, few more people studying, listening to some of my favorite blues artists, um, John Lee Hooker and um, Lightning Hopkins, Lightning Hopkins um, on, the, on, on YouTube, really listening to especially Lightning Hopkins. Um, and uh, one of my favorite Swan Sivertones. I was looking for a composition I heard them do years ago. I haven't the slightest idea of what it was. But I've been listening to them, but I, I haven't heard that particular song um, yet. But just catching up on, on some of my, some of the, uh, old favorite artists, older, older, uh, earlier recordings of uh, some of the early, earlier musicians. How did this journey begin for you? Talk to me about your childhood, where you were born and raised, and kind of how music became a part of your life and how it turned into who you are today. Okay, well, I was born in Blackwell, Arkansas, a little small village, a hamlet, about about 50 miles northwest of Little Rock, Arkansas, going toward Oklahoma. And I, at the age of around six, I started uh, European classical piano. I would go to the nearest town, which was Marlton, Arkansas, about six miles, seven miles away, really. And there was the white Catholic Sacred Hearts School to teach the nuns. I took lessons there. And then I moved. My great aunt who raised me, uh, Mrs. Emma Thomas, my first, my I started music. I, I remember I was about four years old and my uncle by marriage Uncle Buford, who had got a degree, graduated from Tuskegee Institute. I have a photo of him on my wall. He was really a musician, but Booker T. Washington, president of Tuskegee, you know, wanted the young people to figure their lives would be uh, uh, productive if they did things in the carpentry and and work like that with their hands. Um, but he was really a musician. I have a picture with him playing, I think, the, uh, the flute and something was on the ground, a clarinet or something. So he started me when I was four. I remember marching around the room. He was counting four, one, two, three, four, and I was doing rhythms with my feet. 
uh, healing soul things, and he loved to sing. So I was, he started me out. That was my first beginning of our music. And then when I moved to Dallas, Texas, around six or seven, I continued studying classical piano. And around 11 years old, I started playing for the church. And when I was in Dallas, Texas, I studied piano all the way up through college, uh, thinking I was going to be a concert pianist. But that wasn't to, to be. That's what I had in mind when I first went to college. I went to Philander Smith College in Little Rock, Arkansas. It's a private Methodist school. They got their money through the Methodist Church. We had a choir that would travel and do concerts all in Kansas, Oklahoma, to get money for the school. But anyway, when I was in Texas playing for the church, um, I also, there was, I was Methodist, but I would go to the Baptist church and put on plays and all of that. There were the women of the church. I was always in plays, Easter for Easter, um, Mother's Day, Christmas, and I could learn dialogue, so I would always have narration parts and everything. The ladies of the Baptist church put together a girls' group. And first we were singing, we were emulating the quartet singers. And finally, I began playing the piano for the group. There were several girls that could play the piano also. But I was one that was teaching the songs. We would sing gospel songs uh, from the hymns, from the Watts hymnal, from the traditional hymns in the church. And then I began hearing some of the uh, classic singers, classic gospel singers during that era. This was during the 50s. I was beginning to teach some of the songs I heard on the radio. And there were a few songs written compositions. But I could, I could, uh, you know, all that was by ear. And in school, I was uh, doing music in the school. I finally ended up in the cho- in choirs and piano player for one choir, and, and you know, talent shows and things like that. And then I moved back to Arkansas when I was fifteen. And I organized a group for singers, moved back to Blackwell. And this group, we we had two names, the Gospel Four and then the Royal Hearts. We see rhythm and blues numbers. These were male singers in the 50s. Mostly, we uh, sang songs that the male singers were singing. And during the gospel period, uh, the Davis sisters, Clara Ward and the gospel singers, the staple singers, we were doing <clears throat> in the caravans and, and the gospel harmonettes. We were doing, emulating those, well, singing, not emulating, but singing some songs that were popular during that time. Then we decided that it was the right to sing gospel music and rhythm and blues. So we were just only singing gospel music. And that lasted one day. But then we continued to sing rhythm and blues. And we once, so we traveled around a few times, a few times in Arkansas to sing. And we opened up once for the staple singers. And Pop Staples broke his guitar string, and they asked us to sing some more. While Pop Staples fixed the string, and the people were saying, you all sound just as good as the Staples singers. 
with these young ladies, it was like I said, it was four of us, and uh, they could sing all the parts, you know, tenor, soprano, lead, you know, and alto. And the tenor voice was saying was sung above the soprano, above the melody, not below. And uh, very, very, very good. So then when I went to college, I majored in music, music education, with piano being my instrument. And I was, early on, I was I was in the choir in my freshman year, did handle Messiah, did the solos, some of the solos, uh, that was in the Messiah. Student directed first because we had a pianist. She graduated, I became a pianist, and that's when I got into the pipe organ a little bit, a little bit. I was also placed in the band in my freshman year. <clears throat> <clears throat> Pardon me. So that's when I learned to play the blues in the band, in the college the head of the music department, you know, he put me in the little jazz band. And in the meantime, I was in the college choir, and we would travel and tour to get money, you know, for the college. And when I was 18, a young lady came up to me on the college campus and said she had a gig for me, was playing in a nightclub. I told her I couldn't play in a nightclub, but I didn't know. And by the way, I, this was my sophomore year because I moved out into the city. I was in a dormitory where it was cheaper, you know, to get to stay, uh, to move out of the dormitories. So I was playing for the church organ on Sundays. And I would fall asleep and they had to wake me up in the church, when they opened the door to the church, that's when they were inviting people to join the church. I had to turn the organ on and stuff because I was playing in the, in the nightclubs on the weekends and playing at the church on Sundays. So that's how I got started. What was the, the first live jazz show that you ever saw that really moved you? When I was in in college, the local, there was always, you know, every I believe every city has uh Jazz musicians, they don't leave the town, but they're they're highly regarded. You know, uh, this Mr. Arthur Porter, who also taught uh, music at the high school, but he had a group in Little Rock, Arkansas. I was impressed with him. His group was the first one I heard. I'm, the musicians they played for the White Country Clubs. When I was playing my first gig at 18 in the, in the in the club, I was doing solo piano. But the piano players, the the club was in a hotel. I mean, there was a hotel in the building, and the piano players came from Memphis, Tennessee. They would come to Little Rock, and they stayed in in the hotel also. So I got exposed to Yes. And then I heard this group, Arthur Porter. In fact, he he gave me a gig once at the Sam Houston Hotel in Little Rock, Arkansas. It was my sophomore year. And it was a piano bar. And I played there the sec the second night. The manager fired me, he said, because my repertoire was too small. I had never heard the word repertoire. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew I knew what it meant. My feelings were hurt because in the kitchen you had all these uh, blacks cooking and uh, they, so I could, I, there was a free meal whenever I worked there. And it was warm and nice, and 
I remember they had a large glass on the piano for tips. And one man, white, these were white, you know, it was a white hotel. I guess, I don't know if blacks would stay there at that time. But the audience, I remember some white man asked me for my autograph. I never had that experience before, but I gave him one, you know. I didn't know what to say. Yeah. I but anyway, so, yeah, Arthur Porter, he was one of the major uh, pianists at the group in Arkansas. In Little Rock. Wonderful. So you've been fortunate in your career to be all over the world, and you've had so many live experiences. What what memories are you drawing on right now that are giving you strength during this time where we don't have any live jazz? I'm reflecting on everybody that I've, that I've worked with, actually. Just things I've done, Lester Boy, Archer Chef, or Mr. Scott, I've been listening to stuff that I did with Charlie Hayden. So I thought, you know, so I did with his Liberation Orchestra I caught, uh, last month. By accident, I, I saw it. I don't even remember playing that. But uh, I listened to it. I, I, I said, wow. So just when I think about, think back, because our, our music is always on my mind, whether, whether I'm playing or not, I may be reading something. But music is always there, so I'm I'm reflecting and still trying to to move forward to learn and study by reading or watching videos or listening to some music on on the video, on the internet. You know, just trying to keep moving, learning and moving ahead with the music. What do you like the best about being a musician? Well, hopefully that I'm inspiring people and giving love. Why do you love jazz? More specifically, why do you love jazz? I not only love jazz, but I love jazz. When I first heard that word, I don't like the word jazz now, but when I first heard the word jazz, I remember it was around 1955 or 54, and I remember reading about Miles Davis. And I, uh, I was, I, I remember seeing a picture of him, and I, uh, I loved Miles, but I heard the name Errol Bostic, and I think I was reading a Jet magazine, and he played jazz. Now, I don't, I don't hear, hear, I didn't hear Errol Bostic play, but. I knew Miles played jazz, and then I knew Earl Bostic. I saw a picture of Miles. But see, most of the time I was listening to, there was, when I was in, with my mother in Louisville, Kentucky, there was a joint down the street called the Three Sixes. And I would hear, I was looking, looking at her the other night, Big Mama, Big Maybell, singing Candy. And I listened to her the other night because this young man wants to do an interview with me, and he's that's coming up soon. And he's asking for me to give him some songs that I want to play. And I, that's why I was listening to the Swan Silver Tolls, with Mahalia Jackson, Swan Silver Tolls, and then uh, musicians that I've worked with over the years and uh, a few jazz standards. But jazz was a... I liked the way that sound. But I was raised up on doing rhythm and blues and gospel. So when I got to college, I started, you know, playing in this club, solo piano, and Servon, Nina Simone, Dakota State, Cold Strange Impressions. I couldn't play jazz. I tried to play a little blues in the clubs, but I was singing and playing. So I could do some of the easier Nina Simone records. I just was drawn to jazz, and along with the rhythm and blues. When I, my second year and third year in college, 
the drummer, oh, the, the first I played for this club, and it was a jazz club. The brother called the Safari Room. And this man's brother had a club with Ike and Tina Turner. And the blues, the rhythm and blues people would stay at his club. And the jazz had a hotel there, too. But I would want to so the, the second year, the, the uh, club owner that I played gave, put a bass and drum with me. So I had the Mina Cloudy Mines Trio. And the drummer, I would go to Louisville, Kentucky in the summertime. And the drummer called me and told me I, he had a gift for me, but I played the organ. Played, I, I said, I can't play the organ. He said, yes, you can. That's when they started bringing the organs into the clubs in the 60s. I was playing the organ to have me three at the church. And then I started, he said, the organ has got pebbles just like the keyboards. Oh, you play with your feet. So... I would always, it was a rhythm and blues club in Lexington, Kentucky. I would always try to play jazz at the beginning of the night. And I would play the blues and the people wouldn't, they wouldn't applaud. And this club was very, very popular because by the end of the night, it would be crowded, people would be dancing and doing the dog and all kind of stuff. So I was singing all the songs, Mary Wells, you know, uh, all kind of songs that were popular during that. I would learn three songs a night. I would write the words down because I played by ear. I write the words down, but I would always, but I was self-conscious trying to play this jazz at the beginning of the night, and then as the people drank a little into the clubs and stuff, and, you know, the music got really, really wild, you know. So I loved doing and singing the, the rhythm and blues stuff, but as I said, I would always try to play a little jazz. And then when I went back to Little Rock, Arkansas, I worked at this club. It was a jazz club. So and then the pianist that came from Memphis, Tennessee, they showed me a little things, you know, one or two of the piano players showed me a little jazz, you know, little things. So I started playing jazz. And then I continued to play jazz. Then I wanted to be a school teacher. I got a degree in music education. I moved to Chicago. And I didn't think about playing in the clubs in Chicago. I was concentrating on being a music teacher. But I ran across this young man. <clears throat> he was a photographer. And he invited me to go with him. He used to sit in. He played the... He was a photographer, but but, but he played the Cougars. And he would have them in the back of his car. And he invited me to go with him to him to sit in on the west side of Chicago. And... When I heard him play the drums, let's just say he was an excellent photographer. Excellent photographer. And he told the club owners that I could play. The, and I didn't want to play. I was sort of shy. But I, I, was, a, I was aggressive when I was teaching the, the gospel songs and stuff. And the rhythm and blues songs, I was, but I didn't want to, you know, I mean, he told the guy I could play. So I sat in and played, and the band director fired his piano player and called me to be the piano player, the organ player. And that's how I started in Chicago. And then I went to another group, Cozy Eggleston Trio, Oregon Trio. Then Ajarama, who was a member of the AACM, Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians, hired me. <clears throat> I was in his trio, the Oregon Trio. And he, I was, uh, the AACM, I was 
uh, selected to join the AACM. And that really developed me creatively when I got into that organization, which I'm still a member, always will be. And that's when I started. uh, We had to do our own concerts and stuff. And that's when I started developing musically. So I want to ask you this. We're going to get back to live music eventually. And... I want to know from you, when we do get back to live music, what do you hope both musician and the crowd realizes from this time away? I hope they will continue uh, to to appreciate us as artists, which they do already, but accept us what we're doing and what we're creating and how we're trying to, hopefully we, we are able to touch them and they realize how we inspire them through the music. But they do that already. The those, but I hope that we can be exposed more. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our music, you know, uh, uh, we're, we're, it's no, we're not on TV. You know, this music is not on TV. It's a whole different world now with this music. And with, with the virus, hopefully when things get back, and we started working again, we'd be appreciated more and be exposed to the media in different ways and more ways. So my final question to you is this. Everyone has their perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, that you're the one living your life. Who do you think you are? Well, I think I'm realizing more and more that I I do am a musician and a creative musician someone that's uh, created to, to, to like I said, to ins- the main thing is to inspire and to give love, to ins- to help he- music is healing, regardless of what kind of, I don't care what kind of music it is. If you have a, a spiritual connection, and that is, hopefully, I have a connection to to uh, help heal heal people, to make them feel feel good about themselves or about their lives, or to bring up memories of of things that's happened with them, good mem- good and positive memories, to those that listen, to inspire, especially young people, to want to pursue music to help heal and inspire people. And that's what, and to educate people through the music, to let people know about those musicians that have passed on and left positive impressions by doing their competition, their songs, and also by writing music, being creative, and to to uh, to help to help heal and to inspire others and to give out love to the music. Beautiful. Hey, thank you again. Stay safe. And- thank you for calling. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening and tuning into another Neon Jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest singers in New York, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Amina for her time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Thank you. Thank you. Neon Jazz.